Roy Jones Jr. has been the middleweight, super middleweight, and is now the light heavyweight champion of the world. His professional record stands at 40 wins and one loss. The one loss was a result of a disqualification. He has been called by Ring Magazine and by others the greatest fighter, pound for pound, in the world today. But after dominating his weight classes, there is speculation he may try to join the ranks of the heavyweights. Tonight, he joins the ranks of our other guest, and I am pleased to have him here at this table. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Here's what I like about you. December 31st, everybody's out partying, but not Roy Jones Jr. Nope. Where are you? December 31st at 1130, 11 o'clock, 1130 or so, I'm in the boxing gym because I want to bring in my new year doing what it is that I'm dedicated to doing. So right now, I'm still dedicated to boxing. And being that I'm dedicated to boxing, I like to set an example. If you're going to be dedicated to something, that's what you should be dedicated to. And uh, so... That night, me and some of my colleagues get together, and we bring the new year in, do what we do best, boxing. In the ring? Yeah. Um, do you <coughs> think that the world knows as much about you? I mean, are you surprised? You know better than I do right. the level of knowledge mm -hmm. on some meter of Roy Jones Jr. Right. Some say, man, I hear this is the greatest fighter pound for pound in the world today. How come I don't know more about him? Yeah, it's because probably... Number one, I don't have that other opponent to bring yeah. the other half of the guys who watch, who are fans of sports or stuff like that, to come and get a chance to really see me. Usually, the way that that happens is a guy has a lot of people that follow him for one reason or another. Then he also comes up to another guy who also has about as many people following him. There, you get two people together, and they always end up liking the guy who's the better of the two. They even like they like both guys, but. Sometimes it also is the way that you address yourself in the media. Uh, some guys go out and do a lot of things for media reasons. I don't. I just do what I do. And I do what I do best, and I'm very satisfied with doing what I do best. You do that and everything else take care of itself. There you go. Right? Best fighter you ever saw? The best fighter I ever saw, yeah. honestly, yeah. skill-wise, yeah. was a guy by the name of Salvador Sanchez. See, I don't know who Salvador Sanchez because, is. That's right, because you're not that big of a boxing fan like I do. You don't yeah. study the game like I do. Right. But Salvador Sanchez was a Mexican fighter. He died in 1982 in a car accident. He was about 22 years He's old. the best you ever saw? The best fighter all around. That you I saw with your own eyes, not that maybe in film. Fan. Right. The greatest fighter was Muhammad Ali because he did more for our sport and for every other sport than anybody has ever that's done a, to one sport ever, I think. That's skills beyond the ring. Right. That's yeah. not... just that's, That has nothing to do with his skills in the ring because his skills in the ring... You can't really put that on the measure because he didn't do a lot of things, but he didn't need to. There is talk that you're going to put on 15 pounds and jump up from light heavyweight to heavyweight. Probably at the end, of, at the middle part of this year, I will. And I'll, I would only do it to take one shot at the heavyweight title because so many light heavyweights in the past made the jump and, and tried to do it. Not many of them did it. Evander Holyfield and Michael Spinks were the only two that I think really were successful at it. Archie Moore might have done it. I think Archie Moore, he's small, but I think he, he may have. I, don't I think know. he did. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, just because it's there and people say that I have no real opponent that they want to see me fight, then I know they want to see me fight the heavyweight champion. Yeah. So I say, well, So you'll do it. But can, can, you, you, can you win? I can win. If I do it, I can win. If I don't think I can win, I'm not going to do okay, it. Okay, so you can, you can put on 15 pounds of muscle. Right. Yeah. Be so fast to be unbelievable. Yeah. They say, this is what they say about you, this pound for pound stuff is, is, is a comparison with everybody, but you are the fastest hands in boxing. Uh, you think that's true? It could be. There are some guys coming along now that are giving me a run for my money, though, yeah. but, you know, I could be. That could be true. <laughs> what is it that you think boxing ought to do to change? Number one, they should make it to where... The sanctioning bodies can't dictate to you as a fighter what you have to do. You know, they, they, like right now, I'm in a situation where a guy didn't show up for a press conference. Therefore, they may or may not try to strip me of my title because this guy has a history for pulling out of fights, and now he didn't show up to a press conference. Now, I have millions of dollars on the line, and I have to go here thinking that he's going to come, and he left the country. Didn't even come to the press conference. So how do I know he's going to come fight? Right. Yeah. And he has a history of backing out. Now, I got to worry about, well, are they going to strip me because he didn't come to the press conference or what? You know, and it shouldn't be that way. Don King is good or bad for boxing? Both. He's good and he's bad. He's good because he is the best promoter that there has ever been. But in a sense, sometimes the things he do, they're bad because things happen and it's, it seems as though there's unjust in them. And I don't know how it comes out that way. So, but it always seems like when he's involved, something bad happens. 
people always end up having to go to court with them or whatever. I don't know. You know, I don't know what the case is, but I stayed away from it because I can't see how things have been going that bad. How, I, how am I going to change things? Now, would you have made more money if you had hooked up with somebody like King, somebody could, like... I could have made more, but it would have cost hey, me more. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> and been a bigger game, not only would but it, been a, there you go, a lot not, more expenses not taken would, out not only by the time you saw yours. There you go. Not only would it cost me more that way, it would have cost me more morally, and I would have never gone for that. Morally. Yeah, morally meaning that you have to, like, sell your, give them your life and let them take total control of yeah. your life. And I can't do that. Is it is there is a downside to uh, to managing your own stuff like yeah, you do? Most definitely. Just like just like how you said, people don't know where Roy Jones' greatest fighter of all time. Yeah. Why come I don't know more about him? Right. That's part of the downside because he doesn't he didn't set his life to the world so that they can put every little thing out there to make him look like he was something and make it rise to where every time he did something he created a big monster of attention and it just didn't happen that way because I'm not going to do it. You know I can't spend all of my life out trying to create this person that's not there. I'm going to be a happy person. I want to start this thing happy. I want to finish this thing happy. But I mean, should those two things be mutually exclusive? I mean, isn't there some way that you could get the benefit without having to pay your soul and or your moral? It could be. It could be. But right now, I don't know how that is. You know, people say, well, you got to get more exposure, more whatever. I don't agree to that. How many years do you have to fight? I, I could probably, based on not some guys who are coming back, not yeah, George as, Foreman, as, but others. As fast as I am right now, I probably could fight until I'm 47, but I'm not going to fight that long. I'm not going to fight until I'm about 35 mm -hmm. and I'm stopping. Is, is speed something you're born with, or, or can you, you can gain speed? You're born with it to a sense, but you always can work on things to help you take it a notch higher. Yeah. Yeah, God blessed me with speed, but I also learned a lot of things that technically allowed me to be even faster than I would have been just if I would not know what I was doing. Who's the best trainer in the business? Best trainer I've seen was my father. Really? Yeah. He, he's really responsible for you. Mm -hmm. He's the best, by far the yeah. best trainer I've seen. And do you know about this guy, Williams, who is the father of Serena and Venus mm -hmm. Williams? I mm -hmm. think I've forgotten his first name, but you know, he's just done a remarkable job. Done a father of training these two kids. Done the same thing happened to you and your father. That's right, he's done a tremendous job. And somehow, you know, God bless some people to be trainers. He best bless some people to be athletes. In their case, their father probably was never a real good tennis player. My father was never uh, the best boxer, but they were able to teach us and show us what they didn't have to make us go to that next level. That's why this world, in this world, people don't understand God helps people through other people. It takes more than one person to make a superstar. Or as they say, God helps those who help themselves. That's true, too. Uh, but what did he do early, 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 early to make you good. Built a great foundation. I understood everything that I learned, and I learned both sides <laughs> of everything. If I learned this offensive move, I learned why this was a good offensive move, move and I also learned the def how to defend that offensive move, so in case you ever tried to do that to me. Right. So what happened between the two of you? You haven't spoken to him? In no, we, we talk now. We're back, we we, we kind of like, you know, we, we, back, we get along a lot better now than we used to. We go fishing about twice, three times a week. We hang out a lot more now. Oh, really? People, but there was a, people, is it true? I mean, uh, there was seven appearing, years, seven years didn't, talk. Didn't, didn't talk. Didn't what talk. What was that about? Well, I felt like I needed to make a change. You know, God was guiding me to do something different. And there were things that happened that I didn't agree with. There were things that happened that he didn't agree with. Well, I figured, you know what? It's my life, and I, the only person that I'm really going to trust with my life is God because yeah. he's the one who gave it to me. So he's the only person who should dictate to me how I live my life. And it's hard for parents to do that sometimes. And that's one thing that I think um, a lot of people don't understand about kids and their parents. You should always respect your mother and father, but your mother and father also at some age, when, once you get to reach a certain age, they have to learn to respect you because you're now a human being, uh, an adult, just as they are. So they live their life the way they want to. They have to allow you room to live your life the way you want to. And that was something that was hard because my father was always used to guiding me. And it's difficult for them to just give up that guidance role because they feel like, but if something bad happens, they're responsible. Well, they're not. Once you get old enough and they've taught you how to do it yourself, they have to back up a little bit and let you guide yeah, yourself. Right, right. And I that. think um, God changed him a lot and let him open his eyes to see that I wasn't necessarily trying to be rebellious. I was just trying to do things the way I want to do things in my life because God blessed me with a life just like he blessed him with a life. If God would have gave me life and my father lived my life, then what good did it do God to give me a life? None. <coughs> Most of the great boxers are African-American. 
is that because boxing, the ring, offers young African-American kids an opportunity in so many cases to rise out of, of, of less than perfect circumstances. That's one reason. And the reason that's one reason is because... So the dedication and the will is greater. Right. And the dedication and the will, I can't say it's necessarily greater, but the dedication could be a little bit greater because that was one of the only escapes that we always had to be able to come out of all those bad things. You know, you got to look at Jack Johnson. At a time when nobody could do anything, he was heavyweight champion of the world. That gave him so much respect. He was able to walk among the best people to do whatever he wanted. And that gave other African-American kids a, a, a way out. They saw that and they was like, if I can be that, I can be out, I can be free, I can do as I please. So over the years, I think that, that sense of urgency developed or that, that, that sense of being able to pull us out of here developed through boxing. Now it's happening through other things. But uh, people don't realize that I don't think that one particular race of people is any better or better talented or better motivated than anybody else. It's just that some circumstances make you a little bit more hungry. Yeah, right. And by being well, that hungry we're, is motivation right, too. We're in situations Senate. where we're in situations where we have to fight every day just to survive. Of course, we're going to make better fighters because we fight all the time. And people who have it comfortably are not going to get out there and get at it and fight like some people who don't have it comfortable, comfortably, whether they're white or black or whatever. It doesn't really make a difference. If you put a guy in a situation where he has to work to eat, he's going to be a better and a harder worker than a guy who just works because he can when he wants to. Right. <coughs> Mike Tyson, when you see him, well, I'll be honest with you, man. I really, really admire Mike Tyson. I like Mike Tyson as a fighter because it's exciting. But the thing that I see in Mike is that a lot of people said, you know, people came to me one time and I told them that I thought Mike was a little unstable. And they thought that I meant that he was crazy or whatever. No, I don't mean that. I mean that he's not sure of what his next move is because he's not sure of the people around him. He's not sure of himself if he's not sure of the people around him because all these people represent him. And if you're not sure of those people, then you're not sure of yourself. So when I said he was unstable, it meant that I felt like he didn't have the right type of people around him to make him feel comfortable or to help him make adequate decisions, to make the right decisions at the right times. He just, things weren't going right because he didn't have that right guidance. He needs a little bit of guidance, just a little bit, a little bit of confidence back, and Mike Tyson could be heavyweight champion of the world again. But he does have to have guidance. Mike is a guy who needs people around him to help him feel comfortable, but also they can understand him. But there, I know people who will say to you, notwithstanding everything you just said, he could be heavyweight champion, that say he has lost a, he's lost a step, he's lost something, that all of this has taken a toll on Mike, partly because of where his head is, partly mm -hmm. because of the, you know, mm -hmm. what you said about stability, mm -hmm. confidence, right. and partly because of other things. And he could, have lost a, he could have lost a step or two, you know, but... Fact of the matter is, George Foreman had lost a step or two before That's he came true. back. <laughs> but George Foreman still got back to be a world champion. So it doesn't make a difference. If you got God in your life, that lost step doesn't matter. You haven't lost nothing. You gain a one step backwards and you, and you get God in your life, and that's like a thousand steps, a million steps forward. Okay, I got to go. What's your game plan? My game plan is to go out there, do what I got to do, beat this German guy, the WBO light heavyweight champion, right. beat him some part in the middle of next year, then take a shot at the heavyweight title. Unless the opportunity to fight for the heavyweight title arises before that, I'll take it right away. You'll jump on it. I'll he, jump on but it. maybe you're not ready. I don't think, I think I came here ready. The doctor didn't put me out until I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.